Our next topic is star formation. This is going to take several movies because there's a lot of information to get across. Uh, so this is going to be our first introduction to how stars form. In order to understand how stars form, we have to understand where it forms, which is the interstellar medium. So what is the interstellar medium? All it is is the gas and dust between stars. That's what it means. It's interstellar is between stars. It's very low density. Um, on average, there is only one dust particle per million meters cubed, um, and there are only 100 gas atoms per million meters cubed. But the ISM is not homogeneous. It's got dense parts and diffuse parts. And so some of those regions that are dense are important for star formation. And we call these molecular clouds and nebulae. And just to clarify, nebula is a very general term. It just means fuzzy objects in the sky. Uh, and it comes from the Greek for cloud. So when I use nebulae, I really am using it in a very vague way. So let's talk about those typical densities because, you know, saying that there's one particle or 100 particles per um, meter cubed is not very helpful. So the average ISM has much less than one particle per centimeter cubed, okay? And if you've got a, a nebula that is like a planetary nebula where you've got lots of glowing gas, it's much denser at about 1,000 um, particles per centimeter cubed. Once we get up to a dark nebula where it's dense enough that you've, and you've got enough material that you're blocking out the starlight from behind, then you're talking about 10,000 to a billion particles per centimeter cubed. But that's still very low compared to what we see on the Earth, where the atmosphere around you right now has about 10 to the 19 particles per centimeter cubed. So let's talk about protostars and where they form. Um, how do they form in the ISM? Well, essentially, we're coming back to hydrostatic equilibrium. It's a big battle between gravity and pressure. Um, protostars can form when gravity wins. So you've got pressure pushing out and gravity pulling in. And if gravity wins, then a gas cloud can collapse and form a star. Um, but what does that mean for what environments are likely to be good places to form protostars? Well, you need something that's dense, right? You want the particles closer together because then they have higher mutual attraction. Um, you also want it to be cold because remember that in the ideal gas law, P equals NKT, as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. So if you have a low temperature and a dense cloud, then you've got much better chance of getting gravity to win over pressure. So here I've got a model of something that might collapse. I've got um, a big cloud of gas, but it's magnetic. It's got particles in it that give it a magnetic field. So it's got this magnetic field. It might also be rotating, and those are things that could inhibit star formation. So rotation can interfere with gravitational collapse because if it's rotating, you could have a centrifugal force, which means that it will collapse preferentially into a disk. We'll come back to that idea later. Um, but it's certainly going to affect how it collapses. And then if you've got a magnetic field, you can see here, if the magnetic field lines are associated with the material, as it collapses down, those magnetic field lines get closer and closer together. Well, if you've got charged particles in there, they'll be affected by the magnetic field, and you may find that it uh, either distorts or inhibits the collapse. So where should we be looking for star formation? Well, basically in dark nebulae. And there are a few different classifications of these things. We have Barnard's object here, which is uh, a dark cloud. We also have Bok globules. But you can see in both cases, they're dark enough, they've got enough material in them that's dense enough to stop the light from behind them getting through. So just to put this in perspective, the Barnard's object, uh, it's a few thousand solar masses and maybe 10 parsecs across. The Bok globules are um, smaller, they're only about a parsec across and only contain maybe 10 to 1,000 solar masses. And then we also have giant molecular clouds, these are huge things, where you have a few million solar masses and are about 100 parsecs across. But when we have a giant molecular cloud, it's not going to form just one star, it's going to form um, a whole bunch of them, and so what you'll get is uh, it fragments, mostly because of the dust, which we'll get into later, and that fragmentation will lead to lots of star formation. So we get regions where star formation is happening. So within these nebulae, we have a dense part where, where they're densest, they tend to be coolest because it's hard for them to be heated, and they will tend to contract under their own gravity. Um, 
what causes them to be not um, homogeneous in their claps, not just claps all straight in, um, is, is not really well understood, but it possibly to do with dust and shockwaves. So here is just a schematic of what's going on. You've got a big giant cloud over here, and as it collapses, you might have a dense zone here, a dense zone here, a dense zone here, a dense zone here. So as it collapses, those will tend to win out and pull things in, and then you'll get more clumping, and so you end up with all these fragments, and each of those can form a star. Here's a real example of those sort of globules that form. Um, so this is the uh, Eagle Nebula, um, uh, sometimes called the Pillars of Creation. And if we zoom in on this zone, that's this image from the Hubble Space Telescope, these are called eggs, which are evaporating gaseous globules. And essentially each one of these is where um, a star can form. But they're also being ionized by um, stars that have already formed close by, and that's one of the things that's driving the mechanisms here. Here's another example of a star forming region. So here we have Orion. Orion. Here is Betelgeuse and Rigel and the belt. And here's the sword. And that fuzzy thing there is the Orion Nebula. If we close in on that, this is a nice picture of the Orion Nebula. If we close in on this little portion here, what we can see is that it's very hom uh, inhomogeneous. And we've got these little blobs. And if we close in on this little blob, you can see this is actually a uh, star trying to form. This is a protostar cloud collapsing. Um, this is also showing you uh, another region like that that is in radiolabs. So let's go for a little flight through the Orion Nebula. This is based on um, Hubble Space Telescope images and this is all those little globules that we were looking at like here and here. This is basically how they're distributed inside the Orion Nebula. This was derived from Hubble Space Telescope images and so you can see that you've got the zone where you have lots of things forming. And here you can see one that is particularly interesting. It's got what looks like a comet-like shape. It's got these jets. It's got a disk. And it looks like most of them have this sort of shape. And you'll notice that the, uh, the comet-like shape is facing stars that have already formed. Okay, so we need these things to collapse. And something can cause that by disturbance. You've got a cloud of material that is um, gravitationally bound to itself. So you've got all these gas particles, and they're not drifting away. They're basically held into this cloud. If you push them just a little bit closer to each other, that changes the gravitational balance, and gravitational collapse can start. So it could be a shock wave, uh, maybe from a supernova. But you can also get it from a new hot star where it's blowing out the excess material as it's born. It's got lots of high energy photons that can drive radiation pressure. Um, you might have a couple of shock waves meet. Um, but basically the idea is you've got a cloud, you get a star born. Once that star is born, you can have more, uh, you have material moving out because you have so much uh, light coming from this thing, but there's still dust and gas around it, and that's going to be accelerated by the radiation from the star, and that will then lead to um, more shock waves that will affect the gas around it. And so, as you get these expanding shock waves from the stars that are formed, you'll get a propagation into the cloud of more star formation. So, this is how you would get lots of stars forming very close to the same time. Now, let's talk about what happens in detail. The collapse starts with molecular material. It's a big cloud of the gas. It's cold. It's less than 100 Kelvin. Most of it's going to be molecular. And for now, we're just going to consider hydrogen because that's what most of it is. So it's going to be molecular hydrogen. So it's going to collapse under gravity, right? And it's basically in free fall. You've got all this stuff uh, collapsing in. It's converting gravitational energy into uh, kinetic energy. You're accelerating under gravity. The particles speed up. They have more energy. As they hit one another, it thermalizes. Once it gets to a temperature of about 2,000 Kelvin, then actually the, the heating stops. And this is to do with the fact that you now have a mechanism to use up that energy. So the photons that are around and the collisions that are happening mean that instead of having molecular hydrogen, you start to break it up. You're breaking that molecular bond and making atomic hydrogen. And so what this does is it uses up energy, right? And so the temperature just stays at that, about 2,000 Kelvin for a little while, until it's finished dissociating all the hydrogen. But it still contracts, because gravity's still there. It's still falling under gravity. So it's going to um, contract really, really fast. 
um, because but the temperature isn't going to um, increase because that energy is being used. So gravity is winning. But once we have all of the molecular hydrogen destroyed and it's all in atomic hydrogen, now we have another effect that happens. Um, and what that is is that the thermal energy that was being used up to dissociate the hydrogen is no longer needed, and so now we can heat up again. So we're still shrinking, but now the, the gas can heat up again, and so we get increasing pressure. As the pressure increases, we get um, a balance between the gas pressure and the gravity. And so what we get is that that pressure starts to counteract gravity, okay? And so once it reaches that stage, it has to radiate energy in order to collapse. We'll go into this in more detail later, um, but basically it's going to take of the order of a million years to collapse down under gravity until there's enough, um, a, a, enough of a high temperature in the core for hydrogen to fuse. So this is a HR diagram. We've got temperature and luminosity, and it's a log-log scale, and we're starting from something very cold, below about 100 Kelvin, and it is going to be um, increasing in brightness because it's getting hotter, but not hugely more bright, and it's going up in brightness, and then eventually it's going to start um, losing brightness because it's still shrinking, but it's not heating up, and so it loses more brightness. We'll talk in detail about what happens here later, um, but basically you've got something that it's going to get um, hotter and brighter and then it's going to stop getting um, much hotter, well it gets a little hotter but it's not getting much brighter and then it's going to switch on as a star. So that's for basically a young protostar. This is kind of showing the tracks for what happens when you've got different masses and we'll come back to why they're different shapes later. Um, so if you've got a very low mass star, it will tend to go from, it doesn't change temperature very much, but it does uh, go down in brightness, and that has to do with shrinking. Whereas if you've got something that is very massive, it will tend not to change its brightness very much, but it will change its temperature a lot. Okay, let's just talk briefly about observing these things. Um, they're going to be fairly cool. Once they switch on, then they're hot, but the cloud itself is fairly cool, so they should be large and red. They're a big thing that's emitting according to its uh, temperature. Um, but that makes them difficult to observe in visible light, because first of all, they're born in dust clouds, so the dust tends to absorb the visible light, and that means that they're emitting in the infrared. And infrared is much harder to do than visible. Now, for the other issue is that for a one solar mass star, it takes off the order of tens of millions of years to get from a big gas cloud down to the main sequence. Uh, but a star like the Sun stays on the main sequence for 10 billion years. So that means that this protostar phase is less than 1% of the star's lifetime. And that means that there really aren't that many of them. So part of it is that they're just hard to find because they're not that common. They don't stay in this phase very long, so that part of the, of the lifetime is just too brief to observe most of the time. So I want to give you a couple of examples. These are protostars. We have Titori stars, which are protostars of sun-like stars. They have these disks and bipolar jets, just like we saw in the animation flying through the Orion Nebula. We also have what's called herbig harrow objects, which are associated with these um, Titori stars and have to do with the, those bipolar jets. And so here you can see these are images that um, this is a protostar, it's got a disk of dust around it, it's got a star that's trying to form in the middle, and then you've got this big kind of envelope around it. Um, this is another example of that, like we saw in uh, the movie, where you've got a disk and then you've got this kind of shell of material around it, and here's another one. Um, so what's going on with these things? Well, first of all, they, they form disks, and they form disks because of rotation. Basically what you've got is um, that as it rotates, you tend to impede gravity. You've got a centrifugal force um, away from the axis of rotation, but you don't have that extra force in the uh, direction up and down the axis. And so it can collapse much more easily up and down the axis, and therefore it will become a disk. Um, this is something that is fairly easy to, to understand. Um, and so we can get our disk no problem. 
we're not really sure about the jets. The jets are a little bit more tricky. So basically, we know that when you have a disk of matter that's accreting, it can form jets. This seems to be almost a, a universal. Um, it seems to be something that we see in lots of different types of astrophysical objects where you have an accretion disk that you will get a jet. Exactly how they work is beyond the scope of this course, um, but I encourage you to read up on it. And so here is showing a schematic of what you're going to get. Here's our disk that formed because of the rotation, but now it's got this jet of material, and then that's plowing into what's left of the cloud or what's around the cloud, and it's giving it enough energy to glow. And so those are the Herbig Harrow objects. So here I just want to show you, this is a real image of a Herbig Harrow object called HH30. Um, so you can see the jets, and you can see this bright stuff here. And this is a model of what we think is going on. And basically what you've got is you've got the, the disk, which is kind of uh, very dense here, but then peters away. And this get, has an effect on how the light escapes. So you get this nebulosity. And then you also have the jet that is causing material to be bright in the direction of the jet. Okay. And so the last thing in this uh, particular movie segment is going to be just going through the steps of pre-main sequence evolution for a fairly low mass star, a star like the Sun. So we start with an interstellar cloud, and it's huge, um, you know, parsecs across. It has low density, it's very low temperature, um, basically the same temperature throughout. And this is, you know, it's going to stay like once it starts collapse, it's going to, it's going to collapse in about a couple of million years. Once it starts collapse, it starts heating up. So you can see here it's collapsing, so it's getting smaller, denser, and hotter. It's then going to fragment, and so you're going to get it in pieces, and that's going to take of the order of 100,000 years. And you can see as it's fragmenting and continuing to collapse, it's got smaller, it's got denser, it's got hotter, and now there's a difference between the center and the surface. Now it's collapsing in earnest, and we've got a central temperature around a million Kelvin. That's still not enough to do fusion. We've got a surface temperature around 3,000 Kelvin. Um, we have a high density, and we're getting down to the size of a regular star. This just keeps going on for of the order of a million to um, 10 million years, um, and it's just getting hotter and hotter in temperature. Once it gets to 15 million Kelvin in the center, that's when you can switch on the fusion. And at this point it has a much higher central density, um, it's much smaller, and we have a main sequence star. And that's the first part of star formation. Join us again for what happens next. <laughs>